So, I mean, you raised like two very large rounds after each other. November 2021, you raised uh, $30 million. And now mm-hmm. it's $150 million in the last round, last month. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, c- can you tell me what what the valuation was I, I, for the $150 million <laughs> round? Uh, so, so actually the closing happened before, like we just like we announced later. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we don't disclose <laughs> valuation. Okay. Uh, but it was pretty large. Uh, we're uh, right. we're today like the most valued uh, or the most valuable. I can imagine in the Maghreb uh, startup, no, no, in the whole North Africa, uh, Egypt included. That was the voice of Nouradine Taibi, co-founder of Yasir. I am your host Ali Zweil, and this is the Startups Arabia podcast, where you learn about the Arab startups ecosystem from the best founders, investors, and operators in the region. Today, my guest is Nouruddin Taibi. Nouruddin Taibi is the co-founder of Yasir. Yasir started in 2017 in Algeria as a ride-hailing app and has since expanded in many ways. It's expanded its services, going into delivery and payment and other things, and is soon becoming a super app. And it's also expanded its operation into different countries in Africa, it's growing at such a huge clip over the last five years that it's also needed to raise over $190 million, the latest amount of which was $150 million that were announced last month from global investors. Nouruddin has an interesting background. He studied engineering uh, in his home country of Algeria before traveling to Silicon Valley, where he spent a long time uh, getting three masters in different fields of engineering and management, as well as getting a PhD from Stanford. He's worked as both an entrepreneur and in the corporate world in Silicon Valley, gained a lot of experience, and uh, come back to Algeria to set up Yasir and invest that experience in the home country and in the home region of the wider Arab world. It's been a wide-ranging and very interesting discussion with Nouruddin, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I have. Now, here's our interview. Today, I'm very excited uh, for this podcast because I have uh, Nouruddin Taibi with me. And there are several reasons why I'm excited. I mean, uh, this guy, he, he has a PhD from Stanford, three master's degrees, over 50 patents and publications, um, and a couple of startups under his belt in Silicon Valley. And he lived in Silicon Valley for, I think, 15 years. And yet he came back to, the, to Algeria, his home country, to do a startup. So that's one reason I'm, I'm very, you know, I love the guy already without even speaking to him before. And the second reason is the scale of the ambition, because... Uh, I really love the fact, and I, and I want to always propagate this idea that we should have, you know, the highest possible ambitions uh, starting startups from, from our region. And uh, really, uh, his vision with uh, uh, Yasir is actually very much in that uh, vein. So without further ado, welcome, Nuruddin. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, for having me. A really great pleasure to be with you, and uh, hopefully the listeners will, will enjoy the discussion too. I'm sure they will. So maybe we can just, you know, start uh, with an easy question. The uh, easy question about, you know, how you came into the world of startups. Uh, uh-huh. What? How did you end up here? Oh, uh, a series of accidents, I guess. Uh-huh. <laughs> Nothing planned. Uh, so uh, you'll you'll laugh, but uh, kind of like my objective at some point was to become like a. Uh, uh a university professor <laughs> so, so uh so didn't have in mind to uh, to become an entrepreneur at all um i think what made it so, so i was born and grew up in algeria so i got my engineering degree from there and as i said you know the goal was to become a uh, university professor and to do that you have to get a phd so uh, mm-hmm. i applied for grad school uh, in the u.s and uh, that's how i actually made it to the u.s but uh, ended up at stanford and uh, as you know, like Stanford is kind of like the birthplace of uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, yep. Actually, like uh, if you look at like really staggering numbers, like in terms of like the impact of that university on the uh, high tech entrepreneurship scene uh, worldwide, not just like in the uh, in the U.S. or in Silicon Valley, 
I remember mm -hmm. there was a study back in 2014 or 2015 that came up uh, that showed that over 40,000 companies were created by Stanford alumni since the 1950s. And these companies not only employ 6 million people, over 6 million people today, but generate uh, around $3 trillion in revenues. So if that was a country, it would be the sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, which is which is huge. I Incredible. mean, this is one institution. So really, I mean, you know, like as I was doing my grad school, like you know, it was it was contagious. I mean, like everyone was talking about uh, uh, building things, and of course, like you see the success stories that uh, that were coming out, and so, yeah, it was just addictive, to be honest. Um, addictive in a sense that um, you know, when you're in an environment that pushes you forward, um, mm -hmm. you kind of subconsciously do it. Um, and two, like the fact that you see the impact of what you're building immediately, um, I think is like uh, very rewarding. So, so yeah, I really kind of like the backstory story, but like, I didn't do it honestly, like directly out of, uh, uh, you know, right, cool. once I got my, uh, my PhD. Yeah. I, uh, I did have a, uh, a corporate experience at Intel for, for many years, but that mm. corporate experience actually was extremely helpful because it was the, uh, it was startup like, which allowed me to actually learn quite a bit. So I was part of a division called Intel labs, which is the uh, R and D division yep. of Intel. I worked and for Intel too, worked, by the way. So, okay. So, uh, yeah, and yeah. the way it actually, yeah. Uh, the way it worked actually, it was like, it started with small teams, um, like basically pitching an idea to upper management. Mm -hmm. And if, if, you know, like the idea was accepted, it would get funded. And if the idea, you know, grows into a uh, proof of concept, like it gets more funding, the team gets bigger. And so at some point, like it actually becomes a product and uh, can be commercialized. So I got lucky to actually go through the whole process. It was like a really great learning experience. And so it's then, you know, like I felt like I was ready to actually jump off the cliff and uh, build something of my own. And yeah, so I got the chance to build a team, raise funds, take things to the next level. Um, and that was the best experience I've ever had in my life, to be honest. Um, like the level of, like when you're facing problems and you're always facing the wall, it's just, you know, as they say, you know, like a necessity of uh, the mother of all inventions. So, mm -hmm. so you always, you know, try to find solutions. Yep. Mm -hmm. Was that like your first startup that, that you founded there? Or yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think you found it too, right? Were they in, I, I guess they weren't in the consumer space. They were closer to your original. Yes, yes, right? true, true. Yeah, so my background is in engineering, uh, more like electrical and computer engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, like the solutions were actually completely like hardware slash software solutions, uh, uh, complete verticals that we were integrating. Uh, it was actually like a lot more complex. I mean, like if you look at that company, what we were building, I mean, the core of the technology was these um, uh, motion sensors that were highly sensitive, that were built based on nanotechnology uh, and were super small, consuming low power. So we were building these arrays, like tens or hundreds of thousands of these that were uh, connected and data was collected by uh, very intelligent software that was taking real time decisions. And yeah, uh, the applications were mainly B2B for warehouses, hospitals and, uh, and other use cases. Um, uh, so yeah, it was um, it was actually very uh, uh, very challenging, uh, challenging, but very rewarding actually. Like once we got it to work. Yeah, and and what happened to that company? It got acquired uh, oh. uh, by another Silicon Valley company. Okay. Uh, and 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 what kind of made you decide to move back to Algeria, and 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 how did Yes here came about? It wasn't about, planned so. at all. Uh, yeah. It was it was not at all planned. Um, I, I honestly like never thought I would go back to the region. Uh, what happened is that at some point I started getting involved in the nascent high tech entrepreneurship, uh, not just like in Algeria, to be honest. I mean, like in the whole North Africa, Egypt included. Uh, but initially it was in a passive way. So I would mentor teams. Sometimes I would even like write small checks uh, for teams that I liked. Uh, but to be honest with you, I mean, like very quickly, I came to realize that the biggest problem in the region wasn't lack of funding or bureaucracy because people always brought up these as the biggest problems. Um, to me, the bigger problem was the entrepreneur him or herself. And what I mean by that is 
uh, really the mindset, uh, lack of best practices, uh, lack of values, uh, lack of ambition, um, and kind of like pushed me to conclude that if I was serious about doing anything, I should get involved myself, really with the goal to at least attempt to build the uh, local success model that would be emulated by others. And to be honest, I mean, like to me, uh, the best way to learn is by doing. I mean, you're not going to be learning entrepreneurship like on, uh, on a board. Uh, you have to actually uh, have the, uh, you have to jump off the cliff and do things. And that's how you learn. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, that was really the objective. The second objective was also to empower the local talent and more so the engineering talent. Uh, in our region, unfortunately, a lot of engineering talent doesn't have many opportunities and ends up leaving primarily to Europe to pursue further studies or find jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so wanted, wanted to really prove that the local talent could build platforms, very large scale platforms that could go global. Uh, so it was really mission driven. Um, and then the business model is another story. <laughs> okay, yeah. tell, tell me about that. I mean, uh, and the business uh, idea itself. I mean, where, how it started? Uh, um, yeah, so so the decision, you know, to go back was there. But then, uh, what would be the business model? And literally started with an anecdote. I was visiting a very good friend of mine who owns one of the largest shoes companies in the region, and. Uh, while I was in his office, this guy comes in. Turns out this guy owned uh, one of the uh, biggest distribution companies for agri-food products in Algeria. And so discussion with him was super interesting. I mean, turned out that this guy like barely had any education, uh, literally like an elementary school dropout. But if you look at like the company that he was able to build, the processes, it was pretty, pretty impressive. And what's really like, actually caught my attention is that um, they were doing all the transactions in cash. I mean, these are like big volumes. I mean, like you're talking about like maybe the equivalent of like millions of dollars on a daily basis. And they were all done in cash uh, to the point that they would actually not count the bills. They would actually weigh the money. So they would know, say, for instance, how much like a million dollar weighs and the volume is, and that's how they would do it. And to me, I'm like, you know, if there's so much cash out there, if one can tap into it, it could be a huge opportunity. So mm -hmm. started digging further into it and the use of cash, you know, like uh, wasn't unique to this guy or to this company. I mean, if you look at like Africa in general today has a little over $3 trillion in GDP, 72% of it is in the informal marketing cash transaction. And even if you look at consumer expenditure, um, uh, about $2 trillion is expected to double up actually in the next few years. And most of it is in cash transaction in the informal market. And if you look at like why cash is not because of a lack of a banking system, banks are everywhere. It's just that people don't trust it. And the number one reason people, I mean, we need to say it, it's actually tax evasion. <laughs> people don't want to see that traceability. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that trickles down to the consumer. The consumer is like, you know, why do I need to have a bank account and pay monthly fees if at the end of the month I have to withdraw all the cash to buy my milk or bread? Um, and so what was interesting in the region we currently operate in, like the Maghreb region, and to a lesser extent, like also uh, uh, West Africa, uh, on-demand on services that we all know about around the world, like ride hailing, food, grocery delivery, uh, it, it was pretty much in existence. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we looked at the statistics, most people were spending their money. Uh, if you look at like the, you know, like the household spending, it was pretty much in transportation and food. Transportation, because you have very big cities uh, with very high density population and transportation mm -hmm. is archaic. I mean, just look at Cairo, Algiers, uh, Casablanca. Uh, they all have the same issue. Uh, and food, the average family size, just like if you just take North Africa, is around six people. Uh, and so a lot of mouths to feed. Um, and so 80% of uh, household salary actually goes into transportation and food. And so we were like, why don't we use on-demand services? They solve important and immediate needs. And of course, if we execute well, we could have a very large user base that subconsciously trusts us. And really key here is uh, trust. Uh, and because on-demand services are really aggregators, it will give us access to most of the cash that is actually circulating. And uh, what's cool about this business model is that on-demand services are multi-sided marketplaces. So when you start offering uh, payment services, you're not just offering them to your customers. 
You have the supply who are the drivers and the couriers. You have the merchants that are working on your platform. Today, mm -hmm. we connect FMCGs, wholesalers, distributors, producers to, to the merchants. So it's a whole virtuous circle that we actually created uh, through, uh, through this. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you offer payment services, you're touching everything. And when I say offer, it's not just like in terms of really like uh, uh, selling the service to, uh, to all the sides of the marketplace. You could leverage them too. So for instance, mm -hmm. something we're doing today is that we're using the drivers and the couriers as mobile agents uh, to collect the cash and transfer it into electronic money. Um, so yeah, it's a whole ecosystem that, uh, that we've built through, through the execution. And that was kind of like the business model from day one. It just that, you know, when we started okay. executing, of course, we had to build it one block at a time. One step at a time. Yeah. Interesting. So, I mean, uh, I was reading the recently published Forbes article uh, mm -hmm. about uh, Yasir, and they mentioned, like, they were telling the story from beginning to end, so to speak, for, to now, not to the end. We were still at the very beginning, but, uh, you know, for the first four or five years. And um, they said that you guys, you bootstrapped, you and your co-founder uh, at the beginning, and then sure. at uh, eight months in, you were profitable. And I was like, sure. what? In this yeah. industry with, with its notorious unit economics problems yeah. and, and things like that. So I'd love mm -hmm. to understand more how, how, that, how that could can yeah, be. Yeah, so, so, so as I mentioned to you earlier, um, you know, like the, the region we were operating in was pretty much virgin. So we had first mover advantage and we were the only player on the market. Um, and uh, three things helped us quite a bit. Uh, on the uh, on the unit economics, uh, one is uh, the cost of acquisition was pretty low uh, because, as I mentioned, you know, like it was really like a, uh, a strong product market fit. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the U.S., for instance, uh, eighty nine percent of households have cars. Uh, if you take a country like Algeria, it's about like ten percent of the households have cars, uh, and public transportation is archaic. So. Uh, so the product market fit was there. So as soon as we started, like, you know, we were getting, you know, like very high, uh, very high adoption. And the cost of acquisition was around like 75 cents when, you know, like the, uh, wow. the average order value was, um, uh, was around like $6. Um, like, right. you know, like if you take our commission, like we were pretty much, you know, like entering in our investment, uh, uh, like, you know, like once we were converting the user. And because I was at product market fit, you know, like we didn't have any competition to um, uh, like the unit economics were super healthy. Like we didn't have to, to, you know, like crazy discounts or anything like that. And that allowed us to be profitable very quickly. And we were reinvesting actually that money uh, as soon as um, as soon as we were getting it to actually expand very quickly into new cities, uh, working on new products. Uh, uh, so that that really helped us quite a bit. Uh, the the second thing that really helped us is because of the low low cost of living in the region we operate in you know like our salary mass wasn't that big uh we had like great talents and at the same time like we weren't spending much uh on uh, on the team uh so so that helped us too um uh, towards profitability and we were actually cash flow positive um i think like within within the first year year and a half um so it was wow. it was very healthy um, and then uh, the third one, which I kind of, you know, like uh, alluded to is, uh, uh, is the, uh, uh, the CAC that we were having that, that was super low, uh, that just made it uh, work well. Interesting. Yeah. But, but then at some point, quite, you know, uh, early, you decided that you do actually want outside capital. So what yeah. made you decide that? I mean, when did you I mean, know few, that you did that? Well, I mean, like a few reasons. I mean, like you also need to look at the scale of your growth. At some point, you need to grow uh, not just like very quickly, I mean, like exponentially, but you need to do it at scale. And to be able to do that, I mean, just like your uh, product ambitions become very important. I mean, like we're building, you know, like a ride hailing platform, f food delivery platform, a grocery delivery platform, and a payment platform. It's, it's huge. It's like your engineering team 
uh, like to be able to focus and actually roll out features very quickly uh, is an undertaking. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you have to, to have like a very large engineering and product teams. So just the salary mass associated with that is huge. And so irrespective of, you know, like how fast or, you know, like how exponential your growth is, you're not going to be able to absorb that cost. So fundraising becomes important. Uh, two is really even like, Consolidating growth in the existing markets needed more capital, uh, opening new cities, uh, uh, getting more out of your user, uh, building, you know, like a very strong commercial strategy um, that needed that uh, more capital. And then the third one, we always were ambitious from day one. And uh, we didn't think, you know, say like the Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia markets were enough for us. So we always wanted to expand into new markets and uh, show that, uh, not only we're not dependent on a few markets, but also have that ambition of being a global player. So, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll and of course, when, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I was saying, you know, like, and when, when, when you raise funds, like you make the case for that, right. I mean, like you, you show that you yeah. have the plan, you have the financial simulations that back it up. And of course, based on, you know, like what we've been executing too. Um, and that's, that's, I think the tipping point, like when it comes to, uh, to investor investment. Absolutely. And, uh, I'll come back to that expansion part uh, of your strategy, but mm -hmm. while we're still on funding, I, I, there was something that intrigued me, which is that mm -hmm. you guys, I think joined YC in 2020, right? Mm -hmm. You were already, I mean, quite advanced in your mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. What made you do yeah. that? You know, what yeah, made you get that, that question. Decision? Yeah. Uh, Look, as much as I had a large network in Silicon Valley, and like I knew a lot of partners, like in the biggest funds of Silicon Valley, uh, it was always hard for us to actually raise money, uh, simply because the region wasn't uh, wasn't known. Uh, so we always had, you know, like two kinds of responses. Uh, one is, uh, look, uh, we we know you, we like you, but like you have no clue about the region. It's uh, it's too risky for us. We're not gonna. Uh, 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 take it or uh, okay we know you we like you uh, you're building something good uh, we need to take some time to actually build conviction uh, and so so yeah initially honestly like it was always painful to uh, uh, to raise money uh, mm -hmm. irrespective of you know like the network I had uh, and uh, uh, and the numbers uh, at least the initial numbers that we had I mean like we weren't at the scale we're at now to the point yeah. that you know like we uh, uh, we couldn't be ignored uh, but uh, but it was it was the case so with YC like kind of like the spin that we uh, we thought about and actually like took us a long time to make that decision and if mm. you if you talk to the YC partners, they'll tell you that like we didn't give them an answer to join till like I think the day before uh, oh. the, uh, <laughs> the program started. Uh, uh, YC brings up like so many things uh, with it: um, uh, credibility, reputation. Uh, beyond that, actually, like huge network of potential partners. All around the world, yep. by the way, it's not yep. just you know like U.S. based. Uh, uh, the, the kind of support that you get, you know, like from top-notch uh, uh, founders and partners. I mean, it was just like the whole suite that came with it that just like really pushed us to uh, to conclude that it was the right decision. And we were right on the money, to be honest. Uh, right after YC, like it, was, it became like a lot easier to raise funds. Uh, the partnerships, the perks that we got, like were like uh, uh, really of uh, like huge uh, uh, impact on on our growth. So, so yeah, it was. Um, yeah. I mean, like going back, I would have done it again. To you be still honest, still do it. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's you know coming out of YC is when you raised your seed round, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we ha we did have, I mean, we did have some funding before that, but it wasn't yeah. at the level uh, that uh, that, that, was uh, needed. that we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I'm guessing, like in the Algerian ecosystem, there are there aren't any like local venture capital firms that you could depend on. No, right? you had to look outside. No. Exactly. I mean, from day one, actually, that that was one of the. Like initially, you know, like I, I wanted to be like a purist. So I wanted even the funding to come from the region. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and, uh, and yeah, so I would, I mean, although like there aren't, you know, like any VC firms, I started reaching out, you know, like to people that could actually fund, uh, but like no one was interested. Like actually, like no one was buying it. Like they're like, you know, like you're just wasting your time. Yep. yep. Uh, and uh, and yeah, so I had to go back and you know uh, tap into my network uh, to right. be able to uh, uh, to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can imagine you know what you went through. <laughs> so I mean, while, while since we were just we were just talking about your expansion, I, I was saving that question for later, but uh, you brought it up. I'm just amazed by the the scope of your expansion. So you guys are opening up in different countries and simultaneously working on uh, you know adding new services, uh, mm-hmm. and that's I mean people don't typically do that uh you know they, they typically either go deep first and then start wide or they mm. go wide mm. but you've been very early on in your um, in the story yeah. you've been you know going to morocco uh tunis uh-huh. etc so i mean what, what's the what's the thought process that went behind that what, why did you adopt this strategy I, look, uh, there are two elements. One is the competitive landscape. So you really want to, you know, like have that first mover advantage and grab as uh, uh, much as possible uh, share wise. Um, so it was really important that, you know, like we expand in as many cities and uh, at least, you know, like regionally, like in the Maghreb region between Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia and uh, establish ourselves as, you know, um, like, a, you know, like strong player to reckon with. Uh, so that was extremely important. Uh, and then like in terms of like the, the multi-product, uh, offering, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, like it was, it was from day one, our ambition to go there to ultimately get into the payment services. So it was really important for us that we build that ecosystem of interdependent services. Uh, but what was good for us actually is that, you know, like our first market, which was, uh, which was Algeria kind of like became the, uh, the lab. Uh, for these products, so we would not, you know, like launch them, you know, like simultaneously in all the all the geos. Uh, we would make sure that uh, we roll it out, like we understand how things work. Uh, we build our playbook um, and then, you know, transplant it into other geos. Mm-hmm. Um, so the combination of the two just like made it like a lot easier because um, Algeria was kind of like an like totally acquired market for us. So even if we had missteps. Like you mm-hmm. would still be fine if you see what I mean. Yep, yep. Um, and so really allowed us to, to understand things, iterate very quickly um, and just plow through it um, and just be bullish. Um, right. uh, I think uh, uh, as entrepreneurs, like we really need to, you know, like to have that level of risk, of course, calculated, uh, but, uh, uh, but it's that risk that usually, you know, like allows us to succeed one way or another. Right. So kind of expanding geos was about not ceding market share to players who were moving into the other geos, uh, you know, and, and exactly. maint- making sure you, you have that. And, you know, the other, uh, the product expansion was really about the strategy of the company and what you needed to execute on. And you exactly. you always had Algeria as a stronghold. And, and that was kind of how you... Uh, how you did that. Uh, and I'm, uh, so how did it go? How did the story go? Did it go kind of Algeria, ride hailing in Algeria and then ride hailing in, in Morocco and, and Tunis, et cetera, and then Correct. starting the new one more product and, and then adding that to the other countries exactly. and, and doing exactly. that? Exactly. Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, that's, uh, wow. that's how it happens. That must yeah. have been very challenging to execute. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, too. And we also had COVID in the middle, so, which oh, yeah. did, didn't make things easier. Uh, right. We were actually pretty lucky um, that uh, uh, yeah. we launched the the food delivery service in Algiers in in November 19, uh, 2019. And right. it was like a very basic product. It was like actually like it had a lot of issues. Uh, mm-hmm. and we were just, you know, like trying to understand things both from a product, but also like, uh, from a user point of view, uh, mm-hmm. and then February came and we started seeing, you know, what was happening in okay. China and even like Europe mm-hmm. started being hit and we were like, if we don't do anything now, like we're going to be in big trouble. So we took the risk to actually launch, uh, food delivery in multiple geo, I mean, multiple cities uh, simultaneously by March, 2020. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was a lifesaver uh, because all of a sudden, you know, like we had all this user base that wasn't going home. I mean, wasn't going out of, from home, yep. uh, but needed food, right? 
yeah. uh, we also had like these drivers that you know like no longer were uh, uh, were giving uh-huh. rights and so needed to work and then you had all these merchants or you know like restaurants that needed you know to make uh, to make money too yeah. um, and so it, it was really the best time to actually educate everyone yeah. uh, without actually costing us much and uh, so that allowed us to keep growing uh, through covid um, and then when 2021 came and you know things got a, a better in the in the region uh, we really got good at you know cross selling between the products and uh, getting the most out of uh, uh, each user that we had, um, nice. and kept that momentum going till now. Right. Yeah. And and what are what have been the biggest challenges? I mean, operating in in a place you know in a country like Algeria or Morocco, as opposed to what the kind of challenges that would would meet a startup in the U.S. Since you've done both, mm-hmm. uh, how is it different? Uh, different at many levels, to be honest. Um, and to me, like the biggest difference, and I would say like the biggest challenge is uh, the mentality of, uh, of the people in, uh, in our region. Um, there are two things that, you know, I feel like are big impediments. Uh, one is the lack of ambition. Uh, and two is the lack of attention to details. Uh, the rest, honestly, I mean, like if, if you have, you know, like folks that uh, have these two, uh, two qualities or two values, like everything is surmountable, uh, bureaucracy, uh, 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 kind of, uh, you know, like execution on the ground. Like, uh, uh, so, so to me, honestly, I mean, and, and it's still today, like, unfortunately we have to say it. um, it's, it's the quality of the talent that, uh, that you get. And it's honestly, I, Like, I don't blame, you know, uh, people. It just, our educational system pushes people to be like that. Uh, Our work environment, like the industry in itself, you know, like pushes people to be around that. Always, you know, like having someone on top of you, micromanaging you, kind of inhibiting, you know, your creativity and uh, attention to you. Yeah. And so, so yeah, uh, uh, being able to actually hire folks and identify uh, these values and qualities Uh, in them uh, was the most challenging thing. And as you Mm. grow, doing it at scale, it was even more challenging. So till today, to be honest. Interesting. And I'm contrasting that with something you mentioned in, I think, the TechCrunch article, Mm. which is that you want to hire 100% of the technical talent from the region. Mm. So how do these, how, how have you balanced these two you know, uh, things against it. Yeah, uh, uh, it's it, it's not easy. Uh, yeah. And actually, so we got to a point where uh, it's uh, it's getting super hard to uh, uh, to get talent in uh, from the region. I, and I'm not even talking about quality. I mean, I'm talk, even talking about quantity. We became the largest software developer in the whole Nevada region within three years, uh, which, like, in one way, like, we're of course proud of. But at the same time, we're not that big of a team. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to tell you, you know, like how underdeveloped uh, the region is. Uh, what we started doing, you know, like as I was alluding to it earlier, is that a lot of the talent ends up leaving the region to pursue further studies or find jobs uh, elsewhere and primarily in Europe. Uh, so now we're actually tapping into that talent that is from the region that's, you know, like, uh, uh, left and went to Europe and is working now like with the big tech companies in Europe uh, mm-hmm. that identifies with the mission uh, that sees that we actually are building something strong uh, and you know like there is really uh, like a, uh, uh, an objective a mission and uh, a strategy and execution behind it um, and yeah so we're like for us you know uh, we're doing the other way around like we're actually bringing people back Uh, And these are like experienced people uh, that have already done it before, which like in in, like the uh, the industry we work in, it's super important to have, you know, like folks that have done it before. At some point, you know, like especially if you are in the growth stage, you don't have the time to reinvent the wheel. Uh, You need to have folks that boom, like from day one, come in and execute. Yeah, get it done. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, you, so you're kind of hiring the younger version of you. I mean, a, a younger youth, <laughs> kind of getting them to I join don't, you. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's like a version of me, but uh, but yeah, uh, we're we're yeah, uh, like people uh, who went abroad yeah. to be, prof- you know, and and like, gained experience yeah. on how to get things done. 
Yeah, yeah, because honestly, I mean, like, one has to say it. 99.99% of the people are still att- attached, you know, like to their region or to their home country. Um, it's just that they didn't have opportunities or, you know, like, uh, a model in which they they identify with and can contribute so uh, um, honestly like when they see that offer it's like like you could see that the barrier is far much lower i mean i mean of course they think about it but uh, um, uh, they're very attracted uh, yep. by the idea uh, i can imagine um okay um i wanted to ask you now i mean going to the market and the marketing aspect i mean hmm. It just seems to me, I mean, you have, you don't have a two-sided marketplace. You have a multi-sided marketplace. You have, you know, consumers, merchants, drivers, okay. many other people. So, I mean, how do you get the messaging uh, right? How, how, how do you communicate to all these people effectively? Uh, how do you manage Yeah, uh, really, uh, like the brand becomes super important. Uh, mm. uh, so... Uh, so we built uh, that uh, that brand from day one, and kind of like the image that we were giving. Of course, you take it from uh, from the name of the company, Yasir, you know, mm-hmm. which means you know, like easy. in Arabic, easy. Yeah. Uh, so mission statement is as simple as making uh, the lives of our people easy while uh, infusing social values through our products, and like three key terms, uh, like you find in the mission, which we hammered, like in terms of brand building. Uh, the first one is our people. So we always made sure to, you know, uh, put ourselves as this local champion, you know, from the region to the region. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the second one is uh, making people's life easy. And, you know, like we were always choosing products uh, that were actually solving real problems uh, on uh, on the ground. Uh, and then infusing, infusing sh- social values. Um, the fact that, you know, like you use your phone, I don't know, to order uh, uh, yeah, a ride or food or groceries and where, you know, like cash is primarily used, you're subconsciously actually building trust among people. Um, and um, that uh, mission-driven uh, brand building uh, was really key uh, to, uh, to acquire uh, like uh, all the sites of the marketplace as quickly as possible. Add to it, of course, we had product market fit. Uh, the combination of the two um, uh, made, us, uh, made us grow very quickly with little cash uh, and be able to have like very, very sound unit economics. Okay. So you yeah. really focused on building brand. Yeah. And then that makes the follow-up easier. So when somebody uh, uh, from your team walks into a merchant's place, telling them about this here, they already know what it's about and you know what it, how it can serve them and trust it in a way. And, and exactly, that kind of makes yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and, the, and 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 then you, it snowballs, uh, right? I mean, like you have a viral effect, and people start talking about you, and yeah. Right. And so, uh, I I must say that you know. Uh, the story of uh, kind of, you know, like a founder uh, with a Silicon Valley experience coming back to the region uh, does help quite a bit. Um, and uh, we leverage that as much as we could. I mean, you can see it, of course, you know, like in all the PR that we do. Uh, mm-hmm. It's uh, it's always something that comes back, which is honestly like a thousand percent true, uh, but it yeah. also helps like in terms of uh, uh, yeah. growth. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to use it if it's uh, effective, especially, you know, uh, as long as it's true. Um, okay, so I can imagine, I mean, generally speaking, your, your business is pretty tough on the, there's a lot of regulatory hurdles that you have to pass. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can imagine that Algeria wasn't that easy. I mean, uh, how did you uh, go through, you know, tread through that uh, situation? You know, uh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's 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 honestly it, it was the same play. Um, like we're a local champion. Uh, we're not just here to sell a product or a service. Uh, we're you know on a mission, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, the mission to empower the local talent and also the engineering talent, and uh, the um, uh, the decision makers like 
uh, understand that because brain drain is a big issue in uh, yep. uh, like most in the whole Maghreb region. Uh, yep. I mean, honestly, I mean, like in uh, most of the Arab world. Um, yep. And uh, uh, like, just take a country like Algeria, which is about 45 million population. Uh, you have uh, you have easily like four or five million that are uh, primarily in France. And these yep. are like primarily doctors, engineers that couldn't find opportunities in the region and end up leaving. I mean, now, like today, say, for instance, you go to to Paris, like any of the biggest hospitals, like all the doctors are uh, pretty much Algerian. Uh, same yep. thing with engineers, like you find them everywhere. Yep. And so, yeah, brain drain was a big issue to them. They saw like we were on a mission. Again, it did help uh, uh, that, uh, you know, they were seeing someone that uh, that succeeded somewhere else, like had like, you know, like the, uh, a very big uh, experience in uh, in kind of like the hub of, uh, uh, of high tech. Um, and yeah, the story of like, we're on, on a mission, look at like how many indirect jobs that we created beyond, you know, like the engineering talent that we're attracting just made them listen to us. Um, and they understood yeah. that there were legal vacuums and that it was in the interest of everyone, including them, especially in terms of fiscality or, you know, like taxes, uh, that, you know, we would work together and uh, find solutions to, uh, uh, to these legal vacuums. Right. So, so you were proactive in, in engaging them. You didn't use the kind of Uber oh, yeah, method yeah. I, of it, it, ask for, uh, you know, forgiveness yeah. later. Just go for it and ask for forgiveness. You didn't go for that. Yeah. No, no, we did. You did. <laughs> it was a combination okay. of the two. It, it, it was it was doing the, the two simultaneously, uh, but but it was part of the execution. It wasn't like oh oh so we got to a point now we have to do it. No, it was from right. day one. Uh, it was part of the playbook. Okay, yeah. got it. Which we repeat in e- in each geo by in the each way. Each country, yeah. Yeah. So you hire engineers and we do hire, in Morocco and Yeah, Tunis. yeah. We hi- so we hire um, uh, engineering talent in each country we operate in. I mean, even mm-hmm. today, like we have uh, we have operations in Senegal, so we have engineering talent in Senegal. Nice. So it, it's part of the mission, uh, really. It's uh, uh, but it also helps building, in building, you know, like that local champion uh, uh, position. Yep. Hmm. Okay, so. Going back to the um, the fundraising aspect, I mean, it's mm-hmm. important to have the right VCs like next shoulder to shoulder with you uh, on this mm-hmm. uh, uh, journey of yours. So, mm-hmm. how did you uh, choose the ones you work you ended up working with? How how, how did you approach them? Yeah. Uh, how did you prepare for that? Well, I mean, there are two things, of course, you know, like in the uh, fundraising process, you talk to as many uh, firms as possible uh, to kind of, you know, like keep all your options open. And um, once you start getting traction, uh, usually you kind of like narrow down like the number of uh, firms uh, that you want to carry on. And personally, I have like a simple test, you know, like the partners I talk to, uh, I'm like, are these people that I want to go to lunch with or not? You know, like, are these, you know, like people that I want, like, I would enjoy a conversation with or not? Yeah. Um, and, and really, I mean, like, as simple as that. And I mean, like, if you look at our investors today, especially the major ones, uh, we have affinity towards one another. Like, when we see each other, we're happy. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we hug each other. Uh, right. Like, if we go for a coffee or lunch, like, we share food in, like, the same place. Uh, yeah. It doesn't mean that, of course, you know, like we all have fiduciary responsibilities and, you know, like we have to work towards uh, yep, those. But that importance of, you know, like having that personal connection to yeah. me uh, is worth like all the money in the world, uh, to be honest. And um, it, it's def- it definitely was a criterion uh, mm-hmm. in, uh, in the decision making at the end. So. Any other criteria? Uh, uh, well, I mean, of course, uh, like how much you were raising, valuation, valuation, <laughs> terms, uh, uh, the terms, uh, and honestly, like it, it also goes back to the quality of the uh, of the investors that you have. Um, yep. If you look, for instance, at like the last term sheet that we got, um, uh, like in the in, uh, in the fundraising that we had. Right. It was the cleanest term sheet I've ever seen in my life, and we didn't have nice. to negotiate. To be honest, oh. 
Interesting. And to me, to me, that was uh, that was Special. like worth, uh, yeah, worth, worth you know, like more, like anything mm. that you know. Uh, oh, I mean, it's a very good sign for, yeah. <laughs> for the relationship uh, in the you know future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and people, I think, discount to what extent business relationships are are human relationships, you know, and uh, and oh, how yeah. it's important it is to 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 get that chemistry right between yeah, the yeah. people I, who are working. Yeah, ex- ex- exactly. Look, I mean, we tend to complicate things, um, and. We think that you know, like the more complex, uh, the better it should be. <laughs> but mm-hmm. honestly, at the end of the day, it's actually like we need to make things simple. And right. the way you know, like our fathers and grandfathers did things, it was just like a, a handshake and you know, like trusting one another. Yep. Yep. That's how we should do things here. And to be honest, I always tell people, it's like even if your trust is betrayed by someone, uh, one should not stop trusting others. Right. Uh, because you know, like if like as soon as we start doing that, like we fail as a society. Uh, yeah, and so so yeah. Uh, and there's so I'm still much like overhead, and so much time lost, and so much you know. Exactly. You know, yeah, the yeah, speed yeah. of trust is 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 not to be uh, messed with. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm still I, I'm honestly like very old school when it comes to that, and I'm gonna continue to be. Uh, I think I, to me honestly like it's it's an important value, and people mm-hmm. always think that you know like because you're doing tech that, that you know you should not be old school. Uh, right. I don't see them as mutually exclusive. On the contrary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, agree. <laughs> so, I mean, you raised like two very large rounds after each other. November 2021, you raised uh, $30 million. And now mm-hmm. it's $150 million in the last round, last month. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, c- can you tell me what what the valuation was I, I, for the $150 million <laughs> round? Uh, so, so, actually, the closing happened before. Like, we just, like, we announced later. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, we don't disclose <laughs> valuation. Okay. Uh, but it was pretty large. Uh, we're uh, right. we're today like the most valued uh, or the most I, valuable. I can imagine uh, in the Maghreb startup, no, no, in the whole North Africa, uh, Egypt included, okay. uh, and uh, and one of the most valuable actually in the whole. Uh, I would say like even EMEA region, like uh, Europe, right. uh, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, so and I, and I can so, yeah, imagine uh, just. Sorry, go ahead. No, so I mean, like we're we're uh, uh, we're very strong, honestly, today. Uh, Congratulations! And, and and what makes me happy is the fact that you've done it. You know, like uh, locally, and um, to yeah. me, to me, like I did believe in the dream initially, uh, but I also saw the dream. Um, and when I see team members, you know, like working like super late at night, like 1, 2 a.m., like preparing for the day after, uh, and the drive is really ambition, nothing else. Like, you know, mm-hmm. trying to make that dream reality. Yep. Yeah, that's 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 that, that's the most important thing. Uh, yep. And, you know, like when I see these guys, I'm like, you know, I cannot that's fail them. <laughs> so, no, no, honestly, like I'm like, I'm like, I'm stuck. I, can, I cannot fail them. Uh, and, yeah, I, I can imagine. And, yeah. And the other thing also, well, like we don't see much, although like it's changing now, um, like we give like equity to our team members. I mean, like today, um, about like 15% of the total shares of the company uh, go uh, go to the team members, uh, which I think yeah. is super important. Like anyone that's, you know, um, participates in the success of something has to have a part of that success. Um, yeah. I'm oh. I'm a strong believer in that, and uh, I'll I'll never compromise um, when it comes to that. I'm glad you mentioned it as well. So you know, because I, I really think it's important for for the whole ecosystem in, in in our region to understand the importance of giving equity to the team that that, that oh, yeah. pulls these long lights and and really is yeah, yeah. a part of actually. Look, I mean, we all succeed. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We all uh, succeed so together. Thank you for or mentioning together. that. And, and I guess it's the typical structure when, uh, you know, uh, VCs from the U.S., you know, where it's a Delaware company and, you know, you have the subsidiaries and, and all that, of course, just for mm-hmm. our listeners to understand, you know, how things need to get done. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, of course. We can, we can yeah. get into the organizational yeah. structure. And, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, speaking of people who, uh, who are like there till 1 a.m., 2 p.m., you know, I mean, you... Uh, you have teams in several geos. You have teams building several products at the same time. You have different functions reporting into you. I can imagine. Uh, how do you manage your time? How do you divide your time up? Oh, what do you prioritize? Uh, 
how do you do that it's it's crazy so my days start at like 5 a.m and they can easily end at like midnight 1 a.m so just to tell you uh like mm -hmm. today we're talking i'll uh, i went to bed at uh 5 15 a.m and my first meeting was at 7 a.m <laughs> <laughs> just to give you just to give you an idea uh yeah. so yeah like very uh, very busy schedule uh and it's pretty much you know like like this uh, all year round um um of course you know like you delegate as much as possible and as you keep growing you need to have you know like people that you can rely on you identify you know like the the, the most important functions and um you need to you know uh, uh trust uh, of course, you know, like there are uh, feedback loops and uh, processes that, you know, like allows you to measure um, uh, uh, the uh, the growth or the success of, you know, like each team member or each team. Um, mm -hmm. And these are like, you know, like OKRs and KPIs that we include even in our VI. So, you know, like they're very visible and we can, mm -hmm. you know, like tell what's happening uh, immediately. And if, you know, like something is not working, we can uh, remedy to it uh, like very quickly. Um, and yeah, um, that's that's what it is. I mean, today, I mean, as you can imagine, you know, like I'm involved in like a bunch of things within the company. Uh, yep. One is uh, product and engineering uh, because I'm a, I'm an engineer by background, so I tend to try to to gravitate towards that uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot, uh, which I think is really important because uh, usually, you know, like companies. Uh, and this is, you know, like something that you uh, uh, you see uh, statistically. And, you know, like, for instance, VC firms are, like, very aware of that. Uh, most of the successful companies are, like, you know, founder-driven. Uh, and, yep. uh, and to me, honestly, like, product is, like, uh, one of the most, if not the uh, most important thing uh, in, in the success of a business like ours. Um, so that's something, you know, like, I try to spend a lot of time in. Of course, fundraising takes a long time and also investor relations, uh, mm -hmm. operations, uh, finance. Finance becomes, you know, like a, a super important uh, uh, aspect as uh, as you reach, yep. you know, like that growth stage. Uh, and of course, you know, like legal, PR, uh, marketing, you know, like all these, you know, like the, uh, uh, I tend to spend time and make sure that, you know, like we have, uh, we're on the right path to uh, to keep up with our growth and ambitions. And, and what about recruiting? Yeah, uh, today, uh, like one of my most major tasks is, you know, uh, getting the C-suite uh, 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 right. Uh, and right. it's no easy task. It's, uh, uh, I, can imagine. I mean, <laughs> a, a, today, like I reserve maybe at least like 10 hours in uh, a, a week. Uh, in uh, in talking to candidates, reviewing candidates, uh, these are like blocked in, in my calendar, uh, yeah. and this trickles down to everyone in the team. Uh, I always tell the team that, irrespective of you know like how busy we are, we cannot compromise in the quality of the hiring that we do. And you can yeah. imagine, you know, like we're at the growth stage, you know, like we're hiring like 200 people a month, or f if not more. Um, and so, uh, being able to do both. Uh, to do it both qu quantitatively and qualitatively, um, yeah, yeah, it's not simple. Pretty difficult, yeah. <laughs> if not impossible. <laughs> um, Nothing is impossible. So, so, I mean, that's how we push uh, the limits of what's possible. So, yeah, so, yeah, Just, yeah. We we have to push the limits, basically. No, seriously, that's how it is. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I agree with you. Um, okay. And so, so I mean, it's like maybe recruiting is like twenty percent of your time, and product is a big block and then the rest of the functions take the rest right that's how you divide your your time more or less Sounds yeah like. finance ops yeah finance ops uh yeah. like we're very surgical in the way we execute we literally go um like we're not even city by city we're we're district by district and okay. we look at like our our penetration in each district uh what's working what's not working um and uh, and just like try to uh, 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 to keep executing and achieving our growth. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that level of details really requires a lot of work and a lot of coordination. Yeah. I can imagine. So I mean, okay, we're you're, you obviously have obviously have a very busy schedule. 
Uh, we're we're recording this uh, on the 26th of December, so the, the day after uh-huh. Christmas. You're in the U.S., so everybody's on holiday, but you uh-huh. seem to be working. So I can imagine that's pretty, you know, stressful, managing a you know, blitzscaling startup. Uh-huh. Uh, how do you handle stress? What do you do to relax? Oh, uh, I honestly... <laughs> Uh, I don't have time. Uh, I, I don't have time to think about it. Uh, and I think part of it is really like when you enjoy what you're doing, like you don't count the hours. Uh, the stress is there, uh, definitely. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, but like when you enjoy what you're doing, it just like uh, it's the best medicine or the best remedy to it. Uh, yeah. And yeah, uh, uh, you yeah, just need I'm... to be, you know, like goal driven, I think. Yeah, I mean, reflecting on what you're saying, I mean, I think that when we turn when work is fun, mm-hmm. then it's not stress uh, per se. It's it's exactly. actually exactly. Like, almost like yeah. being a sport. It's it's it has that yeah. aspect of it. You know the yeah. the aspect of achieving and and maybe scoring a goal while you're playing football or something is 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 actually fun. Uh, so yeah. and the striving to to score and all that is also uh, meaningful and 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 kind of uh, drives that. And I think in the early stages of startups. This tends to be the the pattern, right? Uh, maybe one day, you know, when you IPO, you'll have a COO who takes care of some of the functions, and someone uh-huh. else, you know, taking, but uh, and you can delegate. Oh, more. it's 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 already happening now. To be honest, yeah. I mean, like you need to, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it has nothing to do with IPO. It, it just like the the scale of the things scale. is just yeah, yeah. You need to yeah, yeah. Yeah, well. Uh, I salute you. <laughs> so, okay, I mean, just zooming out a bit to the Arab region and uh, and the Arab world in general. Uh, do you see any areas that 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 have the most opportunity? Areas where you think you know startups could be successful in the future? Uh, in terms that of doesn't necessarily have to or? do with uh, Yasir. In, in terms of business model, you mean? In terms, yeah, business model. Oh or... man, there is there is so much to do in our region. Honestly, I mean, like I still see it as virgin. Uh, uh, whether that be you know like in North Africa or Middle East and including GCC countries, uh, we're mm-hmm. really scratching the surface. Uh, and uh, and I think you know like a lot of the countries now are at least you know like the big ones are you know becoming aware of the importance of building these local champions because you know. Uh, look, I'm not. I'm not saying you know it's wrong to uh, to let you know like big players coming from the West uh, into um, into our region. Of course, you know like it's it's always good to have that uh, uh, that know-how and level of competition. Honestly, that uh, uh, that brings you uh, brings you up. But we really need to you know like push for more more local champions to emerge uh, and also protect them and make sure that you know like they uh, they succeed. I mean, this is this is what happened all over uh, the world. I mean, you see yep. it like in China, you see China. it in S- Southeast Asia, in India, uh, in yep. Latin America, um, and uh, and now like these local champions have nothing to envy to you know like the big players in the West. Yep. Um, we we need to have that, um, and uh, the region is just like so virgin that anything that you can pick up. Uh, would work as long as you know you have the right team uh, and uh, the right execution and of course you know like the right backers behind it so. okay so I mean before we start wrapping up maybe a last uh, long form question uh, where do you see Yasir in 10 years time what do you think you know you you, you guys will be doing yeah so uh, we will be the uh, largest technology company uh, in uh, in our region, and uh, we uh, we will be publicly listed with at least you know like a forty billion dollar market cap. Cool. And, and and by the way, I mean since it's a super app, will you be opening up the app to others to build on? Do you, do yeah, you see we already that, that in your yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're already actually uh, uh, working on that, getting, you know, like APIs where, you know, like uh, yeah. other players could just plug in into our platform and uh, uh, and add their solutions. Yeah, totally. Extremely cool. Yeah. So, yeah. So so can I just ask you a few uh, rapid fire questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, are there any books you like to recommend to startup people? 
two books. Uh, one is by Andy Grove, uh, who used to be the CEO and third employee of Intel. Yep. Uh, and <laughs> is considered today, uh, I mean, even if uh, after he passed away a few years ago, yep. to be the uh, best manager of Silicon Valley has ever seen. Yep. And he has this book called like Only the Paranoid Survive. Yeah. Uh, and it just tells you, like, you know, like he tells his story through Intel and like the crazy decisions that, that he had to make, you know, like after like board meetings and like shifting completely mm-hmm. gear uh, with the company, but also gives a lot of uh, management uh, advice, uh, which honestly, that's what's missing today. Like we always mm-hmm. tend to romanticize things when we talk about entrepreneurship. Uh, but at the end of the day, we don't give solutions to real problems, to, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, problems that, you know, like founders find like on a daily basis. And that book really like helps quite a bit of that. Yeah. Uh, a similar book to that kind of, you know, like solves that uh, uh, issue. Uh, more recent one uh, called The Hard Thing About Hard, Hard Things, Things uh, yeah. written by uh, Ben Horowitz, uh, who... Uh, who's now like with uh, Mark Andreessen uh, is a founding partner of uh, Andreessen Horowitz and like early employee of Netscape and uh, CEO of the first cloud company uh, yeah. uh, in the world that was acquired by HP, uh, mm-hmm. about cloud. Um, and it, it, it also details, you know, like a lot of these issues, like the do's and not do's, you know, like when you're yeah. facing, you know, like very important decisions, like existential ones and how you deal with them, the loneliness of being a founder, like waking up at like 2 a.m. and, you know, yep, yep. Uh, uh, almost crying, it's like all these things, um, really like hands-on, um, yeah. honestly, advice, uh, which I uh, truly advise uh, 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 everyone to read. A third one, which I started reading actually uh, a few days ago, and mm-hmm. it was offered to me by one of our investors, it's called Burn Rate. Uh, mm. And it's like a journey um, of an entrepreneur and, you know, like how to actually try to balance, you know, like your professional and uh, uh, and personal life, especially like as, as you go through the roller coaster of building, you know, like, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, 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 a successful uh, startup. Uh, interesting so so i strongly i haven't finished it yet but like it's uh it's very exciting so far you already see value out of it yeah yeah i mean a plus one to the first two uh, both of them are incredible books of course anyone who worked at intel is affected by andy and his mm. management uh, capabilities um and of course the hard thing about hard things makes you feel like heard like he really yeah it's like oh it's not i'm not the only one going through this as a founder everybody uh, else has as well so yeah uh, and and if, if if you don't want to read then you know like you just want to do it also like in a fun way and enjoy uh watching something uh i don't know if you've seen like the series or, like uh, silicon valley, silicon valley. On, on hbo yeah. <laughs> like honestly like if you if uh if you're like in the in the in the startup uh, world yeah. like it's it's really portrays kind yep. of like your day-to-day and it's life so hilarious as well so <laughs> i know so yeah. you get so much fun out of it <laughs> yeah so I mean that, that this is a good segue to to my next r- rapid fire question, which is how do you unwind and and stay energized? Uh, family, um, uh, really, or especially spending time with the kids. Uh, it's uh, you know like when I see my kids, I'm like, you know, like I want them to live in a world where um, you know like everyone has equal opportunity, irrespective of where they're coming from, irrespective of what their uh, uh, ethnicity is irrespective of whether they're female or male. Um, and honestly, I mean, like, they're my source of, you know, uh, rest, inspiration, ambition, uh, you name it. I really want them to live in, in such a world. Um, yeah. And just, you know, seeing them grow, do things, try to inculcate these values in them, as uh, like, it just brings, you know, like so much... Uh, Rest, honestly, uh, and and peace of mind. Uh, yeah, beautiful. Uh, in uh, in my hectic uh, uh, day-to-day life. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a beautiful answer. And 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 the third question is, who, who do you think we should get as a guest on the podcast? <laughs> that's a that's a tough one. If you have any, uh, honestly, like uh, we we have great entrepreneurs in the region that are emerging. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, one of them is uh, 
uh, Mustafa Amin from Breakfast in uh, yep. uh, in Egypt. I really love the guy. Uh, yep. Like a lot of affinity with. Uh, there is Ismail Bel Khayat from Morocco uh, with a company called Sherry, uh, a B2B uh, 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 platform. Uh, mm-hmm. There are the Mexup folks, uh, yep. Bilal and his co-founder. Yep. Yeah, I really love the guys. Uh, uh, there is uh, Yasmin Abdul Karim from uh, uh, Yalla in Egypt as yep. well, like building, you know, like, yeah, last mile logistics uh, company. That is, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, honestly, you know, like for uh, like also to uh, to empower, you know, like uh, female entrepreneurs. Yep. Uh, yep. I think is uh, is really important in the region. Uh, like, uh, mm-hmm. so we need to, you know, like push for more females to, uh, uh, you know, to to jump off the cliff and and honestly, like fully support them uh, to uh, to succeed. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, so these are like the ones that come to yeah. mind. But I'm sure, you know, like I mean, there are tons. No, I'm sure. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. But but this is like an A star team. I mean, these are all yeah. great people. Yeah. Yeah. And so what what should I have asked you that I didn't ask you? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, one thing that I always, you know, try to propagate. Um, uh-huh. um, I'm uh, maybe a bit philosophical. Uh, I'm, I'm an engineer by background, and um, the uh, the basis of any engineering uh, education is, you know, like science in general. You know, like all the sciences, whether that be math, physics, chemistry, you name it. Yep. And uh, and there is this like uh, like theory in uh, in physics which I truly believe like it applies to to people to societies to nation to na- uh, nations to companies, and that's the uh, the theory of equilibrium, which simply states that you know like uh, any entity is in equilibrium only when it reaches its state of minimum energy. Uh, and I mm-hmm. truly believe that, as I mentioned, it applies to communities, societies, na- nations, and and companies. And and what's a say, you know, like a like a community, society, nation, or uh, or a company that is in equilibrium? It's where actually, with uh, a small effort, we can create a big impact. Mm. And to me, what what allows us to do that is the value system. Uh, or what we call, like in, like in uh, anthropology, culture in a society. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, like from an anthropological point of view, culture is defined as like a, uh, uh, an ensemble of values that a person finds uh, since birth uh, and uses it as a primary capital and will actually define subconsciously uh, yep. the, uh, the impact, you know, that person will have uh, in his or her society. Um, and so if, if you have like a strong value system that is built uh, on uh, uh, not just like moral values, I mean, moral values are yeah. important, of course, but hard uh, work, but hard yeah. work, ambition, creativity, right. uh, self-confidence, mm-hmm. uh, honestly, like the rest will come, money will come, intelligence will come and yeah so so we need to push for that uh i think you know like to me is really like key to the success of like you you want to build a company um build a strong value system in it uh where we're in with a small effort you're going to have a a big impact you want to build a community you want to build a society you want to build a nation that's what you need and look 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 at all the civilizations around the world i mean like since the beginning of uh uh of humankind really what built civilizations wasn't money wasn't uh, uh intelligence it was yeah. the value system right and the rest will come with it so yeah that's a great uh thought to end with yeah. and um i always like to end with a note of gratitude first of all thank you for for spending the time thanks and second likewise to ask you a closing question about you know what is a gift that someone has given you in life that that has had a positive effect on you well um the value system that my parents gave me i think that's the most valuable thing that uh, or you know the, mo- the most valuable gift i've ever had and uh, you know like values you live them right so yep. it just kind of the uh, the model that you know uh, that they were offering us as kids and we saw them uh, uh, as um, uh, as growing 
and also like the stories of you know like uh, the hardship that they've gone through through their lives i mean i'm from algeria and you know like my my parents grew up during the french colonization and it wasn't easy for them i mean it wasn't you know like education wasn't open to uh uh, uh to uh, to them the the way uh, the way uh, it was open you know like to uh, to French citizens it was always hard sometimes because they were Algerians you know they weren't allowed to get into uh, things or sometimes even risk to actually uh, stop their education but they persevered I mean they were ambitious they they always believed you know like there was something better coming up and just honestly like to me growing up in that environment that was uh, and, you know, being inculcated those values, that was the best gift uh, that I could ever have. Wonderful. It's always yeah. wonderful to have a role model in life yeah. uh, and a positive ro- role model like that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nuruddin. It's been a great talking to you. And uh, hopefully Thanks. we'll see you again sometime reciprocal. on the podcast. Thank you. Oh, yeah, totally. And, uh, yeah, should be should be in Egypt very soon. So maybe we should, wow, uh, great. We should catch so, up. I, mean, uh, I have re- a reservation with you from now. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, we'll have some kushari together. Inshallah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Lots of sauce on it, hot sauce. All, All right. right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of Startups Arabia podcast. If there was something you really liked about what the guests said today, reach out to them on social media and tell them what you liked. And of course, if you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? You don't want to miss any of our great upcoming episodes. Also, please rate us and give us comments on our social media accounts so that we know how to improve. And also tell us what you like. We don't mind hearing that either. Until next time, this was your host, Adi's Whale.